Morning, everybody. We're here today. I'm going to address a topic that we've gotten a tremendous number of questions on of differing opinions, but moreover, misinformation. So we're going to cover gearing today, and we're going to cover some of the basics, give you guys sort of an overview of <clears throat> how to choose the right final drive gear ratio, uh, how to make that decision, and, and what that decision means, and how it relates to other calibration issues. But the first thing we're going to do is kind of drill down on some of the, the details. There's a lot of new stuff this year, um, as always, in this industry, but we're going to talk a little bit about QD1 and QD2 in the Polaris lineup. <clears throat> we'll talk about some of the uh, OE gearing in both Skidoo and CAT also. But what we're going to do, first of all, is talk a little bit about what this means. The, the term uh, final drive ratio, first of all, is a derivative of, uh, of both the gear ratio, uh, such as what you'll see sitting here, as, as well as the driver, uh, which is the track driver, size. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in a few minutes. But first of all, um, let's talk about what final drive ratios are and what you see out there and, and what that number means, first of all. So, so first of all, final drive ratio, I'm going to use an example here uh, of a Kurtz gear down kit. We've, we, uh, we've had a lot of people utilize this product over the past few years. This product touts a, uh, a 2.37 final drive gear ratio and that 2.37 is is actually derived at because of the 2.093 ratio between these two gears and the correction of the driver. Now, you're going to go, that doesn't really make any sense, and I'm going to explain this because this industry has gone through a lot of changes with respect to track pitch, and, uh, and in doing so, they've adjusted the number of teeth on a driver, and I'm going to have Chase grab a driver for me here, and I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So just to make certain that everybody understands, final drive ratio, the last sort of plug, plug in in the equation is, uh, is actually a reference to the original sort of OG driver, and everything is done from that. So that would be on a 9 tooth 2.52 driver. So everything is commonized. The reason that they do that, I don't know if if this will make any sense to some of you guys out there, but uh, it's sort of the same thing that we that, that science does say with the cosmological constant, right? It's the last thing they plug in so that all relevant data is commonized. All information is relatable across different track pitches and things like that. So great, you grabbed, this is an interesting driver. This is a, an, an extrovert driver. You'll see that it has six teeth. Uh, now, on a six-tooth driver like this, you'll also notice that th this is a pretty broad spread from each one of the peaks of these teeth. Um, and, and just to put that in perspective, that's three and a half inches uh, around to the, to the center of the next driver. This would be a six-tooth off of a three and a half pitch track. So, and that's a little bit more common this year. So it's important to know that this is the device that drives the track. More common to, say, uh, an OEM would be a driver like this. Uh, you'll notice that this is a, a seven-tooth driver, and paired with an extrovert in the center, common Polaris setup, this is on a 286, so they're a little bit closer. So what does that mean? Um, why don't we, uh, Chase, grab this, uh, grab this mic and show on this track here. Come over here with me. I got Quinn on the camera. Hi, Quinn. Everybody say hi, Quinn. Chase here running this. So the, the track pitch is the measurement between the center of each one of these two, some people say paddles. <clears throat> There's a fiberglass rod inside the track, uh, and most of the drivers engage that fiberglass rod if they're an extrovert. Uh, otherwise, there's involute rubber nubs that are, that are driven on. But the center distance or distance between those two drive points is called the track pitch. So you'll see this is a 286 track. This is a 2.6 lug height in a 286 pitch. So. You'll, you'll see that uh, as you'll see that, the, like for instance, most of the three-inch tracks are a three-inch, meaning there's a bigger distance between these two. And the new 275 is a three and a half pitch. We can show you pictures of that if you want, but or or, or sh show that, but not terribly necessary. Uh, it's just important to note <clears throat> that as we've moved forward into these different pitches uh, and lug heights, it's necessitated uh, different driver sizes. So each manufacturer, depending on the distance inside the 
uh, or the clearance inside the tunnel, as lug heights have increased, track driver sizes have, uh, have ultimately decreased. And, and so that grossly affects gearing. And you can imagine why, right? The smaller that driver is driving the track, the more revolutions it would have to make to make the track make one revolution, right? So it's pretty simple. Uh, so that's why you have to factor track driver size into the final drive ratio. So this is where this gets really important. The final drive ratio, like I said, listed, say, on the Kurtz gear down kit for an axis is a, is a 2.37, um, but it's actually a 2.093 on the actual gears. So again, everything is multiplied by the same multiplier as though it were sporting a 9-tooth 2.52 pitch. That's the original industry driver and the industry standard, still very much so in lower altitude applications, which still represents a large number of units. So, that, so, so it's an important thing to understand. If you guys have any questions after this, feel free to shoot me uh, some questions. Um, I'd love to get to a place where we could do live streaming and, and maybe have somebody answer questions and whatnot, but, uh, or, or shoot questions to me. But right now, just making sure you get it. That's what track pitch is. Um, so back to that, final drive ratios. To break this down, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just shoot you a few things that are, that are important. It, an axis RMK QD1, and we're gonna call that that because now we have the QD2, so uh, we're gonna talk about the QD1, that's the original belt drive system, on an axis, used a 22 upper and a 43 lower, uh, which, uh, which ultimately was a ratio in the gears of 1.95. It employs a seven tooth driver, which then you can infer is a 20.02 circumference of the track driver on the original uh, quick drive one. So with a 286 track pitch, that renders a 2.209 final drive ratio. So the old axis was a 2.209. The Kurtz gear down kit would change that to a final drive of 2.37. That's lower, higher the number, the lower the ratio. <clears throat> or the, the, yeah, lower the gearing. So what happened though, and this is where a lot of these questions have been fired at us. People are like, hey man, I'm, I wanna put a Kurtz gear down on my new axis with the QD2. And the, the QD2 employs different sprockets. So it is a 22 upper, same as the original QD1, but it uses a 50 tooth lower, which is a significantly lower gear ratio. That renders a gear ratio of a 2.272 in just the gears, and ultimately a final drive ratio of 2.454. And the reason this is important to note is then a Kurtz gear down would effectively be a gear up. Follow me? So do we want to really gear them down? And this is the question that everybody needs to get to. The, the natural assumption that the factory ultimately overgears everything and the first thing that anybody has to do is gear their snowmobile down is a bit of a misconception. And I'll, I'll use another example. This is important. An Articat Alpha uses a 19 upper and a 50 tooth lower with a 7 tooth 3.0. Now that's the biggest 3.0 out there. Uh, it's a 21 inch circumference on the driver, but it still renders a final drive ratio of 2.841, super low. So you don't gear that down, right? or maybe you do depending on your use application, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, but <clears throat> just wanted to throw that out there. So to throw a few of these other numbers out, uh, an Axis RMK with a chain drive, that unit uh, employing stock gears of 1944 was a ratio of 2.315 and ultimately a final drive ratio of 2.50. So the 3.0 uh, units that were out there, the th uh, I'm talking 3.0 pitch, three inch paddle chain drive units that were formerly offered in the axis chassis were sporting a 2.5 final drive ratio already, which was lower than say the Kurtz 2.37 that was, you know, was considered an upgrade on, on the axis belt with a 2.6. So uh, as I alluded to at the beginning of this, when you go with a deeper track lug, you have a greater snow fill, more traction and ultimately uh, benefit from a lower gear ratio most of the time. <clears throat> Plus a, the higher the lug height, the slower your ultimate um, terminal speeds will be. And for that reason, it's not necessary to be geared that high. And, and we'll talk about that premise as well. But moving out, just to throw the other ones out there, a Pro RMK, uh, say 13 to 15 with a belt, used a 21 and a 44 with an eight tooth 286. 
and was a 2.077. It's interesting that the OEMs in that era were definitely overgeared, and so it's very common to gear them down. But as we kind of move forward in time, you'll see that uh, gear ratios have, have inherently moved to lower and lower ratios on the OEM level, and, and we'll talk about the reasons why. Uh, a Summit, for instance, an Expert 85154 uses a 2151, which was a 2.429 in the gears, but with its driver correction, uh, it renders a 2.249 final drive ratio. So uh, anyway, hopefully that gives you an idea of final drives. That's, uh, again, using a final drive comparator or constant, if you will, uh, of the 22.68 circumference of a 9252. Remember, 252 was the distance between on track, so that's pitch. Okay, so hopefully I can put this chart down. Uh, I'm not so sure that that we can get a great shot of this, but if anybody is interested in this data, there's the data that we have on this sheet. Okay, so you can pause that or whatever. Anyway, there's tons more. It's easy to get. You can get it pretty much anywhere. So this is my this is my notes. So not much to talk about here, but I wanted to go back to the beginning. So gearing 101, how to choose the right final drive ratio for you. What it, what are the considerations that a person should think about when making that decision. Do you arbitrarily do it? Because what I get the feeling based on the phone calls and emails I've had this year is that the first thing you do to determine whether or not you should gear your sled down or up is get on a forum and ask somebody. All right, so by show of raising your hands, does anybody agree with that? The first thing you do, I'm gonna pretend like I have an audience. You like that? <laughs> first thing. <laughs> The first thing you do when you get your new snowmobile is you get on a forum and you say, hey guys, should I gear my sled down? That question is not easily answered by anybody other than yourself. Without the data and the considerations, you can't arrive at the answer to that question. So, um, so, so what are the things that, that, you should con that, that you should ask yourself? What's your use demand? What is your riding style? What's your track length and lug height? Uh, what's your target or expected top speed? Um, is belt heat a very real consideration in your riding style? So, so I'm going to back up into that. The higher altitude that you're at, the lower terminal speed you have, the lower horsepower you have, and engine horsepower is a very real consideration when gearing, of course. So one of the things that we want to do is, is we want to start at the top and, and work down to get uh, where you might want to land. One of those things is, so do you run a road? Do you find yourself... Uh, you know, with a flat section a couple miles long and you're just trying to get out to where you like to ride. Uh, if so, you might want to leave a provision in that final drive gear ratio that you can achieve those speeds without rolling your drive belt over when you push it out of the primary clutch because you geared way too low. And that does happen. And that can result in a very catastrophic failure and do a significant amount of damage. My guys will attest to the fact that we we replace oil bottles and clutch covers and belly pans and things like that when terminal velocity is reached and, and, and you keep your thumb in it. So, so it's very, very real consideration. So if that's not a priority, so, so I, I wrote down on here, set priorities because you can't have, you can't have it all right now. You can't have everything you want. Uh, you can have uh, most of what you want, right? So setting priorities is, look, I kind of ride, I like to ride trees or I like to bang hills or I like to drag race or I like to cover ground and I might ride 50, 60 miles in a day, so it's quite a bit of trail. The idea here by doing that is determining really where you find your fun and where you're operating that in terms of the speed range so that we can determine what the right gear ratio is, right? That's what we're trying to do. So keep in mind, and this is gonna be another one of those abstract thoughts, but I want you to try to go with me down this road. Um, the most efficient transfer of energy from the engine unit making the power to the track um, through the drive clutch is when the drive clutch is somewhere around two thirds of its clutch sheet face. So um, some argue it's 60, some say 66. I, I don't really know, but I know that it's around two thirds of the height of your primary. So that would be essentially two thirds of your, of your ultimate gearing. What that means is as the primary closes and the belt moves up the sheave face, at about 60%, you have as efficient a transfer as possible. You're locked up, you don't have a whole lot of slippage, you're going to mitigate heat best in that range because of the efficiency, both uh, in your secondary and in your primary. You're kind of at that one-to-one -one 
uh, ratio when you get there. So, so what we have is no slippage on either end of that, so thus no heat, heat build. Uh, heat, obviously, and, and, and this is very important, uh, and, and people seem to not consider this point, but I, I just want to make sure that you understand heat is an energy as well. So the engine can only make so much energy. Uh, if you expel that energy in heat rather than in propelling the machine, you don't have an efficient transfer of that energy to, uh, to the snow. So, so back to that point, if you bang around in the trees and you're on a naturally aspirated sled versus banging around the trees on a turbo sled, uh, and which variant of turbo you might be employing, it's going to have a very different result with what the actual uh, RMS, if you will, track speed is. What's the average track speed through a half hour of you banging around in whatever it is you like to do? We use, uh, we, we do empirical testing with data loggers so we can actually look at track speed and say, you know what, the majority of this is, is being done in and around 35 to 45, right? That's a pretty common one. So if we were to use a low boost turbo, we're probably in that 35 to 45 mile an hour track speed range very frequently as we're spinning and the, and the unit's not, depends on whether Chase is riding it or not because he's always going 100. Track spinning 100 in the pirouettes and bow ties, but um, honestly, it, it, th this is relevant because that's when you're gonna build the majority of your heats, when you're gonna torture your belt the worst, it's also when you want the most efficient transfer, right? Or is it? So if that's your use, then you're gonna wanna gear optimally for that with consideration for the other priorities that you set. Like, yes, I still need to get down the road at 70 miles an hour, okay. So, and, and if you guys want to hit me up, I can give you some of the factors for what the runout speeds are uh, on each final drive ratio application too. So if you say, hey, I was thinking about doing this, what's the top speed? We do have that math too. I didn't build a chart for it, sorry. But anyway, the important data. So, and then the other thing is, do you go, uh, is, is your most important thing, this is a very common one, is your most important thing, how good you're gonna get through deep snow. Uh, conditions change, things change, but believe it or not, a lot of times that churning track speed constant, when you're on the bar churning up a hill, will the biggest relative factor is going to be horsepower and of course, a proper setup. But those ranges, those speeds will stay pretty consistent. So a uh, high power, you know, like a 200, <clears throat> 250 or 60 horse turbo, uh, like I ride, will often see track speeds in excess of 50 miles an hour uh, on that churn. So, so gearing that unit for say a 70 mile an hour terminal, you could see would put me outside of the efficiency range in my drive clutch, right? I'd be higher than I'd want to be, well over that, that perfect one-to-one. -one. So, um, so, so I might find that that's going to be geared higher than, say, the same unit in a natural. So think about these things. Uh, if you're not sure, shoot me a message. It's fine. I, I'll give you some advice. But altitude matters only because net horsepower is affected by altitude, particularly in naturally aspirated sleds. So Again, what can you achieve? What do you do? What is your, your, your targets? But all these things need to be considered. It isn't just, I want a sled that's rippy. Everybody wants a sled that's rippy. You can, you can very quickly move to a place that, uh, that undergears you. So, so just keep that in mind. And the common mistake I see before I move to the next point on this, the common mistake I see is turbos, uh, because they, they have a period of, of what some term lag, it's essentially the time that it takes to overcome the, uh, the presence of the turbo, you'll, you'll find that, that the bottom end might not be all that you want it to be unless there's boost in it, and then it's, then it's very responsive. So uh, in the lead up to boost, uh, boost charge system, you have that, that period of time. So gearing it down can ease that, right? Can make it better. But ultimately, the higher horsepower results in a lot of the failures that, that we see too, because people will tend to under gear. So, uh, so just keep that in mind, and keep in mind that the QD2 is geared surprisingly low. And, and the next thing this kind of parlays into is how the gearing affects certain aspects of tuning. And I don't want to get too deep in this and bore you guys because you're going to, this is kind of what, what I do, but if you're interested, um, let's chat about that a little bit. Uh, the, as you gear down, you relieve the load that the engine perceives. So what happens through that is you ultimately tend to spin through the axle range of RPMs very quickly. And when you do that, you don't create the, the necessary heat in the pipe. You don't pull that combustion heat out into the pipe through that load event. And 
so two things happen. You oftentimes will overshoot your mark in clutching, so that, that'll uh, manifest as an over rev event where it'll hit, let's just say your target is 83, and it hits 85 and then falls back to 81 and then maybe crawls up to 82, right? That same unit could have had a run out potential of 83, but it's gonna land at 82 because you overshot your mark. You never did build the power that you could have potentially built had you labored that unit through that. So, <clears throat> so you'll see that most guys that uh, take an aggressive approach to gearing, particular gearing down, will pair that with considerations in clutching, either more heel weight to load the motor more during the axle event, uh, or a steeper pre-angle uh, in the helix. So the beginning angle of your helix is where a lot of your pre-shift or, or the initial acceleration event is translated to, so that you can turn that engine acceleration rather than just a, a wing it up into an actual force event that does you know two things, pulls your arms and transmits that heat into the pipe and creates a more stable and better uh, horsepower run out uh, on the big end. So hopefully that's all making sense to you, but that is something. There is other considerations. So substantial changes to final drive gear ratio can drastically affect, um, I, like I mentioned, clutching. <clears throat> but also we make changes to timing and fueling. And this is a big deal. And it parlays into one other little point that I think is a sidetrack. And this is why this, this industry is incredibly complex. And hit up the experts for information on this before you go too far down some of these roads. But the worst nightmare for, for me tuning, say, a turbo that tends to have a volatile acceleration when you overcome that hump is when you have a drastically gear-reduced unit with an enormous amount of effort put into weight savings, right? Um, so, so Chase is one of the guys that is out in the field with me all the time. And so we're, we, we'll put a logger on a unit like that and we induce bogs, right? Because the engine accelerates so quickly that we can't, uh, we can't capture the axle van, fuel can't keep up, things are, tend to be a bit of a mess, right? So, so what we found is that if you are a turbo guy that is trying to maximize the effects, I think in most of our testing it was, you can do a secondary. Uh, if you do a primary, you better not do a flywheel and a, a cup, right? Yeah. And now on a natural, you can do that and get away with it, but it still has to be adjusted in order to pull that heat out. So we'll make some ignition timing changes and fueling changes to make sure we're drawing that heat out. <clears throat> then there's other tools in the toolbox that we can use um, in tuning to get there. But the don't make problems and then get on the forums and tell somebody it was because of your gearing or it was because of this or because of that. A lot of factors that can contribute to the ultimate result. <clears throat> so consult with professionals. There's a reason we're professionals and we're out there every day in the snow when there is snow. Almost had some the other day. We threatened to get out there and do some, some testing, but somehow or another the rocks are taller than the six or eight inches of snow we got. But anyway, we're looking forward to that. So, uh, so just keep that in mind that a lot of lightweight stuff in conjunction with low gearing does create a bit of a nightmare. It has to be clutch different has to be calibrated different. And a way to explain that a little simpler is if you have so much lightweight stuff in there, you're revving through it so dang quick that mm -hmm. one, it's extremely hard for us to find out where the problem is in the tune. Because yeah, without a logger, it's nearly it's impossible. impossible mm -hmm. so. Yep. So yeah, and, and it does cost a lot to get you know a unit individually, the, the time investment on our part and the money investment on your part to get a unit on a logger and spend the day in the snow inducing the scenarios that might create those problems. Um, I mean, we, we always find it. We can make anything run. It just, you know, costs money, takes time. There's no so. magic calculator to figure no. out that it's so, <laughs> um, I had a few other things that came up. So I, I'm taking some notes. Th these are some of the notes I got from you guys asking me questions specific to this stuff. Um, somebody asked me what the difference between track pitch and chain pitch was and what that meant, because chains are, red, are, are measured in pitch too. I wanted to show that. So uh, this is a chain, and uh, so I don't, I don't know if, if you can see this all right, but chain pitch is, is, is rendered very differently than track pitch. Track pitch was the difference, like I said, between the rods. Chain pitch is actually the total number of link spacers. 
that there are. So this, for instance, is a 74-pitch chain. 74-pitch <laughs> really only means how many link spaces there are. So that pitch, again, this is our industry that does a few things, a little strange. Some of it comes from different industries, some of it as a result, but that's the reason why. So, so a different chain pitch is literally just a different length of chain, not anything else. Um, as also, another question related to chain. So, uh, yeah, you can come over here. I, know I, t I tell him keep the camera a long ways away so he can't see, you know, can't, can't see all my flaws. No, I'm just joking. Uh, so standard chain setups like this, uh, just to, to understand when you're choosing a chain gear ratio, um, and, and, you, and people will tend to, because it's the simplest and cheapest, reduce the size of the upper chain sprocket to, in an effort to, um, to, to, to lower the gearing. But what that does is creates a situation where you have more bend back. To, so, so there's a tensioner inside your chain case that will bend the chain back. The more you back bend a chain, the, the more efficiency loss there is. Same thing with the belt, actually, as well. Just the less number of angles, even though it's not on the tension side, meaning it's driving it this way, so this side is the tight side, uh, there's still some parasitic loss due to the amount of bend back. Um, there is some advantages, too, though, that you can talk about as you get to very small ones. You get a greater tooth engagement with more bend back, and there's some other things like that. But, but I just want to make sure that you understand that efficiency is, is, is adversely affected. So we tend to often try to pick a combination that keeps the chain the straightest it can be. And also in our empirical testing on loggers, we have been able to kind of end the question of what's more efficient. I love this question because there's, there's no simple answer, but there really is a simple answer. Uh, a chain drive, uh, this is, this is the, the, the kind of the 10,000 foot view. A chain drive actually is more efficient at high speed than a belt. I know some of you belt lovers are gonna be like, ah, oh, get the eggs out, throw the tomatoes. Uh, it's, just, it's just a fact. This system, there's almost no parasitic loss at high speed, uh, provided you have an appropriate gear ratio installed. Uh, these systems tend to, uh, this is a factory belt drive. They tend to lose a little bit at high speeds because you do have a little bit more heat at high speeds. And there's no heat in, in one of these systems uh, because you're not bending something like that. Everything is on a lubricated pivot rather than physically bending a belt. So the hotter it gets, the freer it gets. They've done, there's a, there, there's the friction interaction, um, which as a chain pivots and comes off of the sprocket, it doesn't have quite the friction reaction that you have when a belt engages the cogs and doesn't. But that's, but, but the belts, have the obvious advantage of being lower inertia. No, the weight is lower, and for that reason, the spin up and acceleration event is more dynamic and is quicker and fits most people's needs. So when it comes down to rideability, I think the industry has spoken that <clears throat> belt drives are, are the preferred way. And, and that's really a result of the customers like yourself that have given the feedback to the industry saying, hey, I just like the way the belt feels, and so do I. So you'll notice that I run a belt on mine. The lower inertia and quick spin up uh, of the belt drive and the loss of complexity and having to carry oil in a heavier chain case, whatnot, all of those things are advantages for our industry. So, um, so don't, don't, take, don't, don't get me wrong on, on, on uh, any love for chains. They're, they're a durable and great system. They're very efficient at, at high speeds and long range for those reasons. But uh, the belt drive for most mountain riders is a more appropriate, uh, is a more appropriate drive. Just wanted to, uh, to, to get that out of the way. I'm sure I'm gonna get beat up on that later, so keep the hate mail to a minimum. Um, let's see. Uh, we had other, th yeah. a couple of the other things that we, we might wanna cover is track length and track length changes as well as lug height. And is there any just basic formula that I can say, hey, I'm gonna go from a 55 to a 63 now. This is happening a lot now because people are transitioning into, uh, into, well, the cut tunnel thing, right? That's kind of a big deal. You can look around uh, the shop or a few of my posts here, and we've had, had quite a few units that have, that have been, you know, tunnels cut on. Um, there's some advantages to that. We'll do another segment on tunnel cutting. But one of the things that a lot of people have done that had 155s have just ran a 163 rail and track or an extension in the 55 tunnel. Um, but don't, don't forget, when you go to a longer track, there needs to be a provision for gearing. For instance, uh, if you buy a Skidoo, 
154 versus a 165, they have two different gear ratios in that unit, um, and, and, uh, and, and as well they should. So um, changing those gear ratios in, react in, in uh, direct re relation to your track length does matter, and that has to do with all those same variables we're talking about, what's terminal speed, um, and, and what type of riding, and what's gonna be the, the churn speed. You're gonna obviously have a little bit higher track speed when you're uh, churning a, a shorter track than if you were churning a longer track, right? Ground speed will be higher, track speed will be lower. So uh, all of those considerations have to be made, uh, as well as switching to, you know, some, there's some bigger tracks out there, um, you know, well over three inch stuff now that is, is getting used uh, in some applications. Uh, some of those applications will require a smaller driver, which gears you down, in which case you may have to gear up in your chain or, or belt drive system to accommodate an even smaller driver yet. Uh, but keep in mind that this is all relative. So I hope all of this translates into something that you guys can have a reasonable takeaway from. I mean, that's ultimately I'm about trying to let you guys in on and, and open your mind to thinking about kind of all the different variables that, that go into this. So um, in a nutshell, don't just throw gears on it. Don't jump on your forum with your buddies to figure out what to gear it. Um, consult, talk, think about it, consider, set your priorities, and then and then, uh, and then reach out and, and we can help you uh, make the changes necessary to keep you up on the bubble as far as optimal runability. But I hope that's, uh, hope that's informative and let me know what else, uh, what other topics you guys would, wanna, would want me to talk about. So happy to do it. Thanks, have a good day. See you on the snow.